Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. We're going to wait a few more moments as people are logging in from wherever you may be joining. Uh, and we are very, very happy that you're here with us today. Uh, in the chat, let us know where you're from um, and we'll get going here very shortly. Thank you. Hello again. Welcome to the Allstacks webcast, The Two-Headed Monster, Culture and Metrics. We'll be talking about VSM today. My name is Parker Ennis, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Allstacks. Uh, today, we're going to examine value stream management through the lens of the business and uh, help you frame the most common problems that you may be facing at your organization uh, when adopting value stream management or undergoing digital transformation. Uh, we'll talk about what you can do to, to overcome some of these problems and then talk about some metrics and put um, some of the metrics that could be most effective and matter most into context for you. And we will go right ahead and introduce our guests today. Excited that they are here with us. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Hirsch Tapadia, who uh, has graciously agreed to share his uh, expertise on the topic. Hirsch. Really nice to meet everyone. Um, as Parker mentioned, I'm Hirsch Tepedia. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Allstacks. Excited to talk about this today. All right. Thank you, Hirsch. And then we'll introduce our second guest. We also have Dr. Krishna Kumar, founder and CEO of Exathink. Dr. Krishna. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, uh, Hirsch and Parker. Uh, I'm, I'm Krishna, and I run Polaris Advisor Program. It's an advisory program that helps companies use data more effectively to improve the flow of work and product development. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, a quick little housekeeping here. Uh, before we get started, everyone that's listening, we will have a Q&A session here at the end. We'd love for you to participate in that. Uh, so as you follow along here, think about some questions that you may have, anything that pops into your head along, along the way, and, and feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, we do have a live chat available on that landing page where you're seeing the video. So do uh, feel free to engage in that and we will go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is, is kind of the, the evolution and how we got to where we are today from, from DevOps to value stream management. Um, and I'll kick it off with a, a really cool statistic before I hand it, hand it over to Hirsch that Gardner says by 2026, we're going to see 80% of organizations uh, using value stream management to align their software delivery priorities with business objectives. Uh, and so that is kind of where we'll start. And then we'll talk about how we got to a world where uh, we're growing so rapidly towards that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think it's, it's a great stat because it highlights in a lot of ways the culmination of what we've all been working towards, right? Ultimately, we're trying to get to a place where what we do every day is aligned to the goals of the business. The, I often tell this story about one of my very first jobs. I was working at IBM as a developer. And one of the things that I couldn't figure out and nobody in my division could figure out ultimately, at, at least nobody could verbalize, was how the work we did every day as developers impacted the growth, the top line, the bottom line of the company. 
and what was the through line to that, right? And so it it created a situation where there was essentially an, a disengaged population of developers, right? It created a culture where we had a group of people who ultimately it felt like it didn't matter what we did every day would impact the business. And thus it becomes very hard to ultimately say like we're creating value and you end up in a position where uh, if you think about these large enterprises, especially in today's market, you'll get to layoffs, right? And, and when you get to layoffs, the layoffs feel like no rhyme and reason because you don't know how what you do impacts the value of the business. For a long time, this was this was somewhat natural because of the, the kind of start and stop nature of how software was developed in the 80s and 90s, right? Like we, we wrote something, then we sold it. We built something, then we sold it, right? Once we sold it, then we said, oh, hey, it's not quite right, so let's build a new thing and then sell it. So essentially, it was disconnected from value. But we're not like that anymore, right? We've gone DevOps, we've got SaaS, everything is cloud. The, the movement from what we're doing to value is very close. But what's been missing for a long time, what I'm excited to see is that there hasn't really been this push to ultimately actually make the connection. To say, oh, we're now we're shipping every day. Are we impacting value? Yep. Has anyone even bothered to ask the question until very recently? So now, now to see these changes, right? What we're seeing in the market, I think what Krishna is seeing in the market is that now all of a sudden the business realizes that, hey, actually delivering value, not just delivering software is the centerpiece of our success. Yeah. And so let's actually focus on it. Let's demand it, which yeah. is what's really exciting about what we're doing today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. I think, I think uh, you know, my perspective on this is um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a developer. I still write code and you know, I still build a platform that supports my business almost every day. Um, I think the, uh, the major, there's a lot of focus on developer productivity and so on and so forth in the industry now. Uh, but you know, as Mick Kirsten pointed out in a slide that he put up at, De um, at DevOps um, um, in Dose, you know, the actual work that developers do lives in a small part of the system, right? The bigger system is full of friction, right? And so whenever we, whenever we think about improving developer productivity, the developers are the most expensive part of the organization, but for them to be productive and to deliver value, the system has to let them do it, right? Uh, and so focusing on that green box there, or even you know, even to a certain extent, the red box is not enough. Uh, the red box is important because that's basically the cost of delay uh, and not getting the stuff that you do out to, to get value. But the, the, a lot of a lot of stuff happens upstream too. Uh, and VSM, you know, as a discipline, you know, as as an as a sort of umbrella concept, is about tackling all of them holistically as a system, right? Uh, and it requires data, it requires science, it requires, you know, a rigor. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that come into it, which as engineers, uh, it's pretty exciting because I think that, you know, when I was, I've been in this business for a long time and, you know, when I was just like you, you know, in the field working as an engineer or even as an engineering leader, uh, I was mostly flying blind, right? And I think that uh, we have, in the last about six to seven years, we've gotten a lot better uh at getting the tools we're still learning you know we're not nothing is nothing is fully baked yet we're still learning this craft but um you know it's it's a lot better now than it was you know in the old line of code days uh we have much richer data you know much more nuanced uh, analyses uh much better awareness of how to deploy it uh, but all of this ultimately is still focused inside engineering and bringing it to the whole value stream and thinking about the relative value of things we do inside the value streams and inside an engineering organization, once that moves into the engineering organization, as well as just the business, that's when you get the true mind melt. Uh, and so, so to me, that's that's what makes value stream management an interesting idea and, and, a, and a word that people don't use much. But I think it's a useful word because we don't have something that describes that quite as well. You know? Yeah, value stream management is certainly having its moment again, right? And, yeah. and it's nice to see. I think I think what's really interesting about this slide is this slide presents what the actual value stream should look like, actually the, the physical shape of it, right? Yeah. But the reason one one of the things that we we really try to tackle with all stacks is why is the value stream actually look like this and not what I think the perception of the value stream is.
is this kind of sideways hourglass, right? Where we have all these things coming in and it's pinched in the middle in that green box of developer productivity and all these things coming out of the other side. And they're saying, oh, you know, why is that? And a lot of a lot of the problems we see is we we take this approach, this two pillar approach of like commitments and capabilities, right? And capabilities is is really what we're talking about here in the value stream, and then how we direct it towards value is our commitments. But if you only think about commitments as like new features delivered to market, right? Roadmap tackled, then yes, it's inherently going to look like this hourglass shape, because that new feature delivered to market is just a small slice of the work that engineering is doing, right? And in a lot of organizations, it could be as low as 25, 50%, depending yeah. on the nature of their business. Yeah. And so it's one of the reasons why, why I think data is such an important part of shifting the cultural conversation is that it's critical for us to demonstrate that it's not an hourglass shaped value stream, it's actually a pipe. Mm -hmm. And how we direct that pipe is ultimately going to determine which value we deliver. And yeah. that narrative has been really challenging to tackle. And I think now our constituents, right, our stakeholders are open to that conversation because we can come in with the data and advocate for it. Yeah. And so it's incumbent on us, like you said recently, just, just now, that um, now that we can demonstrate with the data and these nuanced analyses and what we do, we apply it to our culture and then we bring forth this joint story that says, well, here's what's really going on. Here's the shape of this value stream. And it's actually much richer than, than maybe you thought. And let me show you how. Okay. And, and most people are not, not aware. Right? And they have, they have you know, completely uh, uh, inaccurate mental models of what mm -hmm. is actually happening in inside their organization right uh, and engineering has always been a black box for the longest time so you know people are not used to even thinking critically about what they see right i think uh, all of this is you know it's changing it's changing quite rapidly and i think you know the people who are adopting it are seeing the results but as we, as we all know there are challenges i mean there's lots of cultural factors which we'll get into but i mean there are there it is the idea is i think that value streams you know, the original definition of DevOps, we look at Gene Kim's work and stuff like that. I mean, it, it was always about value streams. You know, for some reason, you know, we sort of focused on Dora and the sort of end of the pipeline, uh, but it was always about improving the whole value stream. And I think that uh, uh, it's now coming, becoming a reality where people are, you know, sort of becoming more mature about it. And, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's an inflection point, which is good. Yeah, for sure. I think that's great. Um... And reinforcing, you know, how we got here, right? Why are organizations looking? Um, why are we going to be at a place where 80% of organizations are going to be adopting this, right? And some of that research you saw um, from the state of the, the state of VSM report from our, our friends over at the VSMC um, shows that, right? Because high-performing teams are, are, are more likely to be using value stream management and practices and platforms. Uh, what about you know, through the lens of the business, right? To connect these dots before we get into some of the common challenges and problems. You know, culture metrics, we talk about these as the, the two-headed monster. You know, what have you seen um, from both of your experiences is kind of the market response to, to VSM gaining adoption? And, um, you know, why is the business side of, of organizations seeing this as advantageous? Do you want me to take it? Okay. Yeah, you know, I think I think there's a few things here, right? There's this journey, and and one of the things I talk about a lot is that like any any new buzzword that comes out, there's you know, let's say there's a ten year journey, we market the the ten year outcome as the two year outcome, <laughs> but it actually is going to take ten years to get there. We're just to build the hype. We talk about it happening in two years. So, like we regularly come across organizations today that are still migrating to a cloud provider um, and thinking about picking up the ability to deploy more than twice a year. And they're saying, well, man, I think in 2024, we'll start thinking about that, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so although, you know, there are a lot of bleeding edge organizations that deploy multiple times a day, they can do really tight cycles, they can iterate really quickly. That's not true for, for the whole organization, for the whole industry at large. And so there's this level of attainment the industry at large has to get to for then the vernacular and, and the idea of 
value stream and getting engineering as close to the business outcomes as possible to then become part of the global narrative, right? right? If you think about it, like a board member speaking to another board member, right? Or a CEO speaking to another CEO, they're saying, you know, what are you thinking about in the business? And, and so how often do you have to hear the same idea over and over before it becomes part of just the fabric of, of how we manage our businesses? Well, we're, we're kind of at that moment. Like what we've observed at Allstacks over the last 18 months is we've tripped that threshold. Yep. Right Now businesses are looking for this kind of data because they want to understand when we do this work, when we invest this money, how is that work aligning to the goals of the business, right? We have, you know, let's say we have three OKRs and we're doing all this work in the engineering organization. What percentage of that work is top tied to our three OKRs versus other things that are, may also be important? And then in many cases, a, a bunch of things that may actually not be important, right? Because we built this great pipe. We have this amazing capability, but it's not directed. It's not focused. Right? Yep. It gives some some opinion to the work we're doing and, and allows us to to make investments rather than treating it like a black box right <laughs> the black box thing i mean you know krishna you know this right like it goes all the way back to our engineering school yeah treat everything like a black box right yeah. first we learn about transistors and then we yeah. abstract that away that's abstract a black box away, yeah. <laughs> and so we're taught to abstract on abstract on abstract on abstract until we get to the end and we're saying oh you have this microcontroller now you have a cpu now you have assembly now you have you know or process language. Now we're all using Python and we don't really think about anything and, you know, on, on and on it goes. So um, it's just implicit and explicitly built into engineering as a discipline. Right. And so it's not a, it's, it's not a reflexive behavior to deconstruct the black box. We're, we're taught to rely on the black box, but that's not really how the rest of the business is taught. Right. And so we have to meet that, right? Contextualize the parts of the black box that matter so that we can we can get aligned to the business. It's really a cultural shift. And but I also say that it, you know, I think that technology has a lot to do with this. It was not possible to do what mm -hmm. we are doing now, even eight years ago, right? The cloud, yeah. you know, get APIs, uh, you know, even people who are migrating off-prem are still using the cloud patterns, you know. So mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it was the data is much more accessible now uh, that you know that you couldn't do this even if you wanted to. Now we still haven't learned how to use the data. Let's let's be clear about that. I think mm -hmm. there is a lot of stuff going on out there with the data that is you know problematic, but uh, but at least it's there and we have the basis to actually build that craft and the science uh, for as an industry. So which is which is what's exciting about where we are now, you know. And for, to your point about companies, you know, who are still on prem and so on and so forth. In fact, those are the companies that need value stream management first. You know, their first thing is not to do Dora metrics and do pipelines and so on and so forth. They got to fix the flow of work. I mean, they got to fix, you know, what's coming, supply and demand, and all that kind of stuff. Right. You know, which is which is really the place where having data uh, is going to help you, right? Uh, and so, it lets you sort of get into DevOps when it becomes the bottleneck. You know, uh, right now, what people do is they use DevOps. Okay, let's start with DevOps, you know, and let's get us speed this thing up at the end where everything else is like, you know, messed up. Uh, so I think value stream management is the right umbrella to begin approaching the four stages, you know, four clusters of that door and so on and so forth. Uh, so it gives you a much more powerful language to talk about not just pipelines, but talk about business, value, portfolios, platform, you know, um, it just gives a I think to your point, one of the most exciting things about the advances that allow us to do it today is the shift from governance to grassroots ownership. Mm -hmm. right? We don't have to, because because all we have is course data and somebody gave us a mandate, you have to measure things. Um, we had to do all sorts of things, right? You, you, the business would say, oh, we're going to measure the butt of every every joke in our industry. We're going to measure line of code and then that involves yeah. myths or PRs or whatever, right? That's that's going to happen, and because the data is so coarse and hard to access, we have to limit and, and expensive to access. We have to limit how much we measure, so we're, so we're reduced to simple, coarse, un, unfulfilling measures. That's not true anymore, like you said, right? So what that allows us to do is take this grassroots approach, right? Measure the data that's appropriate, and then use that to then advocate up 
a narrative that that helps you accomplish your missions. And I think that's one of the things we think about a lot in this shift is, like you said, uh, these these legacy companies that are still on prem, for example, that really have to figure out the flow of work before they figure out DevOps because you're not at the one yard line all the time. Um, <clears throat> For those, because the data is so much more rich and different in different parts of the organization, each team can say, oh, the part of the flow that disrupted for us is X. And the resources we need to solve that disruption, personal to our team, is Y. And now I can go and advocate for those resources for my team to make yeah. our part of the flow better. That if we do and pattern that behavior across the entire organization, now the compounding effect of that is massive to the yeah. company, right? But it's small iterative steps that get us there. Yeah. And different industries are different. You know, they have you know different dynamics. Um, not everybody needs to deploy every day. You know, I think uh, there's a so I think I think ah. that you can work backwards from the needs of your business mm -hmm. and figure out what engineering performance needs to be to support the business. And you don't need to invest any more than that. Um, I think that that's part of the the nuances are you know our people are still sort of getting to the point where we're actually having these more nuanced conversations as opposed to all right let's go find Dora metrics because you know accelerate sets so, right and that's three years ago that's changing much yeah. faster we have a textbook yeah we have a textbook right? and the textbook is great it's, yeah you, everybody should read it it's got a lot of work on it right but you gotta read the book <laughs> as opposed to uh, you know taking a, taking the cliff notes from it so. I think, uh, you know, I think one of the things that fascinated me when I was listening to y'all talk about this, you know, when we were prepping is some of the problems and in, in, in sharing your experiences, what you've observed. Um, and I think that would be really useful for, for people that are here and listening. So, you know, twofold. Let's start with what are some of the barriers uh, for adoption if you're a new organization or um, this is something that is, is not uh, mature uh, at your organization? And the second part of that would be you know, if you're already you know, taking a VSM seriously and how would you optimize and get to where you'd like to go? So we'll start with the common barriers for, for new adoption. You know, I'll, I'll start with something very basic. We don't encounter this as much anymore, but in, in the beginning, you know, we always had to ultimately ask the question was like, does anybody care, right? Like, have you actually been embraced and integrated into the organization or is this like a hobby for you yeah. because you're a data-minded person? And so we would get down to the point of like, well, if we really want to champion this inside of your organization, who's responsible for delivering the bad news when something doesn't ship, mm -hmm. right? And start with that person. Okay, what pain does that cause and, and how do we overcome that? And what's the impact to the business when that person has to raise their hand and say, you know, uh, that big release we were going to do that our revenue plan is modeled on. Yeah, yeah that's not going to happen, right? Who's sending that text? That's the person that you have to identify. And, and I think, you know, in all things, right, there needs to be a champion, right? Like we, we want the ideological pursuit of flow and value stream and data to, to be sufficient, but it rarely is, right? Somebody has to champion it. Yeah. So, so we always start there, right? What's the number one barrier to adoption? There's no champion, there's no, there's no consequences. Um, and, and that, that really gets in the way to start. And I, I think, I think the, the, uh, uh, another, another common barrier is just making the argument with data. Uh, it's not a muscle movement that people are familiar with, right? So you will do a lot, you know, I'll often come and do the analysis, show people the data and they say, yeah, well, we already knew that. Why do I need the data to tell me that? You know, the point is that the idea of communicating uh, in data is a different thing, right? Because it, the, the language that, that lets you say, okay, here's proof. Here's what I need you to do. Here's what I expect will happen if I change the needle. And here's the outcome you should expect, as opposed to blah, 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 something I did, something that, which is, which is our, our current kind of status quo, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that it's a maturity issue. I think people are still, you know, getting used to all this stuff. There's a lot of distrust of data, you know, in side engineering teams, as you know, especially when it's done from the outside. So I think that's a huge cultural factor, right? Uh, and those are all things that we have to acknowledge, right? I think um, the fact is that executives care because they want the outcomes, but until the people on the ground care, 
uh, and they can actually see the value in it for them, uh, much of this stuff is going to fall apart, right? So I think I think that you know, we are somewhere in the middle on that. I mean, I think people adopt tools, they look at dashboards, they they do reports, great. I think I think reports is I think the reporting problem is really well solved now. But making change happen, that's still very hard, you know. And that's really where I you know, I'm still I mean, most of the time. That's where I I'm doing my work and. It's a combination of how do you actually sort of get the data, make the move the people, when know when to push, know when not to push. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a social dynamics combined with technology, combined with data. It's a it's a really fascinating problem. That's why I do it. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not easy. It's not. It's hard. It's not. One of the things we we say internally is we say no chores before fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> So we feel like one of the biggest baggage of value stream for a long time was the amount of work it took to start. Yeah. So then let's 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 initiate this project, usually consultant led. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna rebuild all our tooling and infrastructure so that the, the data is measurable. That's gonna take two years. And then we'll plug it in and two years in we finally get the first light. Yeah. And then we say, now what? But at that time, you're two, three years in, you're fatigued, the budget's overrun, nobody's happy, nobody cares anymore, the champions left, we're, we're done, right? And so that, and I think was the, the reality of it for so long. Now, you know, we can get plugged in 15 minutes later, we can show you where you stand. <clears throat> and we can say, instead of saying, let's do all this work to get you to a measurable place, let's measure first, baseline the org and say, you're biggest bang for your buck, your smallest iterative improvement that's disrupting your flow is here yeah. for this team, right? Yeah. Not just here in your org at large, but here for this team and it's appropriate for this team to solve. Yeah. Right. So that just, just that starting small, very iterative. And ultimately we say, let the data tell you there's something to do here so rather than do doing yeah. guess and check. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, and I, I think I think I, you know I think that's absolutely true. And I you know the part of the reason I I, I run primarily my business is an advisory business, but I built a platform which kind of kind of, kind of like I, in similar lines like a, what what all stack does, but really it's customized to support my business. Uh, but I did that only because I wanted to do exactly that. You know, I wanted to go in, be able to sort of get get the time to insight had to be like you know mm -hmm. a month or less i mean it takes me a month to figure out to talk to people and they still have to build context around the stuff uh, but it's not because the data is not there uh, and the other yeah, part the other is part that you should not have to your 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 organization shouldn't have to change itself completely before it can be measured you should right. be able to measure it in place and then figure out what you can get from those signals right because otherwise, you know, you, you just have such big barriers. You know, it's you already you know already lost the game before you started the game. So, um, totally, I totally agree with that. That's awesome. Some great comments in the chat too. May bring a few up while we're uh, while we're talking here. Um, and, you know, before we talk about this, you know, some of the potential solutions which all have alluded to. Um, you know, I, I recall Hershey saying the other day, "You can't not measure things." You know, it's just we live in a world where that's not possible. And, and that stuck with me. And, you know, I thought, well, then how do we make it successful? Right. And so when we think about the cultural piece, um, you know, there are there are going to be cultural barriers. And so from the perspective of you as an engineering leader and, and, and a CEO, you know, what are some of the ways that you can you can approach healthy you know, cultural change versus, you know, a toxic approach to, to cultural change? <laughs> you know, I think the most important thing is understanding that everything has a trade-off, right? And so, you know, what was the old way? Uh, it, it, it's also a lot of the baggage of why um, why we resisted measuring things for so long, right? And we, we have a simple measure. Okay, we're going to measure velocity. Right? And say, okay, we're, we're measuring velocity. So you put up a number, we shipped, you know, 55 story points last sprint. And what is the executive going to say? Executive is going to say, well, how do you ship 75 story points last sprint? Right. And they say, just figure it out. Yeah. And well, that's not satisfying, right? It keeps us from there. But, but the problem is industry wide, like the ship has sailed. You're going to be measuring things. Like we as engineering leaders are, it's incumbent on us to make our organization successful. We have to include measurement as part of it. So what do we have to do? We have to connect it to value. 
right? And so if you can say, okay, you know, we were having a conversation with a large enterprise uh, in the UK, and they said, ultimately, the executives want to see balance sheet metrics. How much money did we make? How much money did we lose? What are our margins, et cetera? <clears throat> and they don't know how to connect. There's this gap between engineering metrics and balance sheet metrics. So what do we do? Well, well, we talk about influence. What does the work we do influence? Well, we shipped performance improvements that, that make the ability to interact with the product less friction prone, yep. which then increases CSAT and NPS, which then reduces churn, which means we lost less money or EBITDA goes up and the executives understand, oh, okay, I understand why we're investing in that. Right? So it only takes a few hops yep. to orient it. Yeah. It's just the onus is on us as engineering leaders to do that work. Nobody's going to do it for us. Yeah. So just we have to connect the dots. Yeah. What about you, Krish uh, you know, Krishna, from your perspective, before we talk about the metric side of it, you know, from your perspective as an engineering leader, CEO, and also a consultant, right? Um, you know, some of the desired versus undesired outcomes, you talk about connecting those ways of working. Um, anything that you've noticed that um, is really, really important as far as the cultural aspect. I mean, I, for me, as my experience is that it's still the engineering organization. I, so I usually come in as an outside consultant. I'm usually hired by either the CTO or the CEO. Sure. Uh, it's a lot easier when it's the CTO. It's a lot harder when it's the CEO uh, because the CEO really wants stuff to happen. And you're working from outside the engineering organization, which is always a, it's a rough you know, a transition. Uh, but I think the, um, the uh, engineering organizations are still relatively resistant uh to measurement uh and i think that they prefer measurement when it comes bottom up which I, I believe is the right way to do it right i do believe as you said earlier you know the the goal for all of this should be to give tools to the folks on the ground to advocate for the changes they want to see you know and i think that you know we are just the dynamics of the industry how we sell products and so on and so forth i think it's still largely bottom up when top down driven and so i think that uh, when we can break that barrier, you know, building trust, being building rigor into what we do. And I think, you know, one of the things that I always see is um, like you're as an engineer, the, the data that you look at should reflect, should be intuitively obvious to you. Right. So uh, and the metrics that you look at, you shouldn't sort of look at them and say, well, that's a bullshit metric. You know, I think I think we are still in that like you know safe not so safe zone there's still stuff there out there that is, that's bullshit metrics versus useful metrics uh which is why i actually like flow as a as a concept because it is rigorous you know it's based on physics there's like, you can actually go back and uh, mathematically justify it which for me is, is very important like you know it's not we're not making stuff up right uh and so i think i think that the street cred of metrics yeah. In the, in the, in, inside the engineering organization is terribly poor. Nobody believes that you can actually do this, you know? Yeah. And so you know, we have to face it. We have to sort of get that, you know, out on the table and actually convince people of that, you know? Uh, and I think a lot of what I do in, you know, is trying to educate as well. When you're doing this stuff, you know, you educate, there's a lot of FUD out there. So, you know, you have to break through all that kind of stuff before um, you can actually sort of really get to the point where value stream management happens, which is you're actually changing things that, you know, uh, that, uh, that uh, impact the business, you know, uh, yeah. that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the FUD is a great point. I think the fear is a great point, you know, and, and the BS metrics is a great point. One of the things we always say is like, well, you know, we, we don't have a lack of computing power now. Yeah. We don't have to measure just one thing, right? We yeah. can measure two things, we can measure three things, we measure five things. But what we say is set it up in tension, right? So if you game one, it detracts another. Yeah. If you game two, it detracts a third, right? And eventually you'll, you'll ring fence a set of metrics that allow you to advocate for a position, right? So even take lines of code, our favorite, our favorite uh, stomping ground. Um, <clears throat> if you wrote no lines of code yeah. and you're a, in a role where you're supposed to be generating code, they go, well, that's an indicator. Right. If you wrote a lot of lines of code, what does that tell you? Well, it doesn't necessarily tell you anything. A lot well, of if you, right. If you wrote a lot of lines of code where the bulk of the code was rewriting yeah. in very short order and all you were doing is gaming the system, you'd say, oh, you know, that's that's not good. The churn went up. Oh, the tests aren't passing. Oh, the tests aren't passing. OK, well, and, you know, now we opened a ton. We say we need to add PRs to it. Well, now we opened a ton of PRs. None of the PRs are getting accepted. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, the, yeah, nothing gets merged into, into production. 
Well, now we've like created a chain that we isn't hard to measure, right? It's like yeah. four or five metrics. You put it together yeah. and you say, well, now we can paint a picture, right? And that's not even necessarily the, the best example, but it's an example of how, because we have resources, we have a point of view and we have context. That says this is a, a producing role yes. of a team that if you put it together, says this, this set of people, when they're doing work this way, if they take this like Confucian middle way ideology mm -hmm. where they balance these five metrics, we're going to generally have a good state of flow through this part of the pipe. Right. And then you take those puzzle pieces and you link them together. And ultimately they then chase all the way up to say like, and of that flow, we want, you know, we'd love to see 40% of it go towards roadmap. Yep. Well, if we do 40% towards roadmap, we need to really get our bugs down. So we need to spend some time on maybe a couple bug sprints so we can reduce our, our load on bugs, so we can reduce our switching costs, our cognitive load, as, as Stephen was saying in the chat, yeah. um, and focus for a little while. Yep. And then the long-term benefit is, is realized, right? But who can do that, Krishna? Like you said, the folks that can do that, that can make that argument, that can paint that picture are the team. Yep. Not the executive. The executive can't do it. The team can do it. So, and, so and it is that the team to paint the picture. Yeah. So I mean, I and I, I look at this like um, I you know I usually draw a causal model of the metrics, um, that you that you pick, um, because you really want to be able to say moving this moves that, moving this moves that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you have to be transparent about that model to everybody concerned, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think when you actually hide the data, you hide the metrics. You know, people are being measured without telling them and all that kind of stuff. People do this kind of stuff, right? Which is why, really why it becomes becomes toxic, right? And I think if you have a rational model uh, that says, okay, these are the five things. You know, if I have, if, you know, it's like flying an aircraft. If you look at the cockpit, these those individual metrics, you know, airspeed and uh, you know altitude and all those things, they're not independent of each other. They all depend on each other, right? And and the pilots know how to read all of them together. It's not one number, right? Uh, and so you have to be able to do that kind of uh, model for the, for the context. And when you do that, you know, it works. I think. Uh, but it, it requires education. I find it just requires a lot of education, you know, and there's people automatically come in negatively predisposed. Uh, and so you got to work out, work through that, work through all of that before. Uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the time I don't succeed. I mean, quite honestly, it's just, it's just sometimes it's too hard. So, you know, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a learning, learning process, you know? Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, you know, uh, I think we have a few, questions that are very common that I'll pull up here on the screen that we'll go through. Um, and while we do this, you know, anyone in the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to grab them for when we do Q and A. But I think to kind of bring some of this together, the culture and the metrics, um, we can look at uh, a few questions that will be helpful um, to answer. So, you know, what are some of the top capabilities that I should be looking for if I'm an organization or a team? I'm looking to do VSM, you know, um, you know, how do you use these metrics in a way that can't, you know, could be viewed as toxic? How do you avoid that? Right. We see the McKinsey article, the developer productivity coming out. And then, um, hey, there there are some that agile is still a foreign concept. Right. Waterfall is still a real thing. So how would you get started towards this path? Um, if you all want to maybe um, swap questions and um, go through these, we can uh, we can give them a little bit of advice. You know, I think for for number one, from my perspective, it's all about time time to value, right? The, the quicker we can get to working on operating on the value stream rather than getting ready to operate on the value stream, the better off we are. And anything in between that uh, is is just a non-starter. Don't even bother. What about for number two? Uh, any any insight? Krishna, on you know um, how to avoid this this word that we hear very commonly now uh, that I did not expect in development you know toxic um, <laughs> how to use you know data and metrics for good yeah well I mean I think I think it depends on what you're measuring right first of all so I think um, a lot of lot of the uh, a lot of the toxicity comes when two, because of two reasons one is you're not clear about why you're measuring things. And then two, the met it's not clear that the metrics you're measuring are actually the things that would measure the things you're measuring, right? Uh, productivity is the classic example of that. You know, almost all examples of measuring productivity end up kind of being just like 
I don't know, is that, is that productivity? Is that, it becomes a whole discussion, right? So I think when you look at um, the, um, if you look at what you're measuring and why, um, I, I try, I mean, because tox, toxicity is something that I'm very careful about, right? And I think so what I, what I, what I do is, um, I like the, looking at the flow of work because it is safe. Uh, because it doesn't get into that mess about individuals and all that kind of stuff. What, you, what we're looking at is really solving a problem that is real, which is the flow of work in most organizations is completely messed up. You know, work is sitting around, there's too much delays. The cognitive load, as Stephen mentioned in his question, is huge because people just have too many things on their plate most of the time and, and managers don't know it, right? Uh, so those are, to me, those are the canonical examples of, you know, doing metrics for good because you're really actually looking to improve the system, right? Uh, what you have to be careful about is that those metrics are actually reflective of the situation on the ground, right? And with flow metrics in particular, that is kind of hard if you're not careful about how you do it, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, you still have you still have to have the rigor to do it properly, but uh, I try, I, I avoid the toxicity by just sticking, sticking the safe problem to solve. That's my approach. I mean, there's, there's other problems which are much harder to solve. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I look at flow as a very, improving flow as a very safe problem because everybody needs it. Uh, you can do it without getting into all sorts of, you know, uh, noisy questions about individuals and, you know, and it actually helps improve collaboration culture. So I, I, I just avoid the toxicity problem. Like I said, that's the way I would put it. Yeah, sure. Then we'll have uh, about a minute if you want to answer number three, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of bring everything together before we do our official Q and A. So a great time, chat, to uh, put your questions in the chat now, so that we can get to them here shortly. <clears throat> you know, from my perspective, like Agile is a tool, right? It, it, it's it's a methodology. You could use Agile. You could use you could use anything, right? If you want to use Waterfall, that's fine. Use Waterfall. Yeah. In both of these, you know, how do you get started down the path towards VSM? Like, it, the the key word in this is towards, right? What are we working towards? Right? We're actually not working towards VSM. We're working towards some some idealized future that we're trying to attain, right? And it's the same with the previous question on toxic, which is like, what do you envision? What what are you not accomplishing? What do you envision the world to be like? What do you want? your company, your organization, your team to look like that everything else is then falling under, right? So it's incumbent on the on the leadership to say, like, I, I wish we would lose less customers. Yeah. Right? Or I wish we could sell more product or you know, I wish and, and just be really on the nose about it. Like, oh, I wish development costs less money. OK, how do we do that? Well, we could go faster. Well, how do we go faster? Well, we could improve flow. You know, oh, we could uh, spend less time on bugs, more time on features. Well, how do we do that? Well, we need to squash a bunch of bugs first <laughs> so that we have more time to spend on features. So, you know, like it's very important when we're engaging in these initiatives to be very clear about the outcome we're trying to realize at the business level, right? To go way back to the beginning, the Gartner study at the business level. And thankfully, what the data seems to apply, imply, what the, what the trends are showing, is that that conversation is opening. Yeah. That that window is opening. The aperture is there, and we can now actually go and have that real conversation with more and more organizations every day. Yeah, I love that. I think that's one fun. important thing I would say, add to that, um, Hirsch, is uh, that issue management is not a project. In other words, it's not something that you do once, right? I mean, you, it is something that you are sort of committing to do uh over the course of you know uh, the rest of the life of your company right and i think that you have to learn how to do it right uh and so i think that is that is a fundamental shift the capability that you know um, in the industrial production world they do it routinely they've been doing it for 20 years 30 years but they weren't before i know until toyota and other people came in they weren't doing this before right uh so i think that it's a shift in the industry where this just becomes something that people have to learn how to do as organizations right uh, and there's tooling, there's theories, there's technology, there's a whole bunch of steps that needs to happen. Um, but ultimately, we've been doing all these agile digital transformation as projects, like, you know, as though they're just going to do something and plop, it's gonna, something's going to happen. Uh, and the reality is it needs to be infused into the DNA of the organization, right? Uh, and it's it's a long, it's a, it's a hard lift. We shouldn't pretend it's not, right? And I think that, but we can move fast. We can make changes quickly, right? Uh, but it's a, it is a, a learning experience, so. It's awesome. Thank you. Uh, and 
right on track here. Uh, we will uh, transition over to uh, Q and A. Uh, we, you know, about about 15 minutes left or so. Um, so we will head over to the comments and, and open it up again. Anyone in the audience, please do feel free to add your questions. We see some good ones here uh, and one that we popped up on the screen um, a few minutes ago from Stephen Walters. I would say question for the panel. Um, so many enterprises are struggling with people turnover due to cognitive load stresses. Uh, how can value stream management aid in reducing cognitive load? It's a really, really good question. Thank you. I'll take that one since I uh, well, talked about it before. The uh, the so there's uh, there are a few different ways in which cognitive load manifests itself. Right, first is just the sheer complexity of the work we do day to day. Right, technically, and you know we have to deal with uh, stuff, technology, business problems, infrastructure. Uh, it's a it's a complex domain, a knowledge domain to be working in. So there's individuals have skills. Uh, cognitive load that is imposed by the sheer amount of skills you need to do the job, right? Uh, but then uh, add to that, there's a cognitive load imposed by multitasking, right? So which is you are given way more work to do than you can finish. There's interruptions, there's emergencies, there's bugs to fix and so on and so forth. So you take a cognitively demanding job as an engineer and then you flip the compound it by context switching, right? Uh, and it just makes it thing exponentially worse. Value stream management can help with the second part. Value stream management cannot help with the inherent technical complexity of the work, but value stream management can make it so that that is the real complexity of cognitive load. That is, it can take the load off due to the unnecessary waste and delays in post because of multitasking, poor collaboration, all those can be identified. You can reduce those. Then the problem becomes a really hard problem, which is, how do you actually chain this goddamn piece of software to make you do what you want to do uh, in some more reasonable time without breaking something else? Like, you know, which is which is kind of which is great. If you can do that, that'll be great. Right? Uh, yeah. So that's that would be the way I would answer the cognitive load question. Yeah, I love that. And uh, another good one uh, from Jay. When I'm advocating for our organization to get more serious uh, about value stream management and invest uh, more so that we can be transparent with our engineering data, what are some tips? that I can have to help get that buy-in from leadership, right? And get that endorsement to, to move forward. You know, what, on this topic, <clears throat> it's all about connecting it to the, the outcome that leadership is trying to create, right? So do we really understand what are the challenges the business is facing? And then how do we contextualize what we're trying to do in those challenges? Because if we do contextualize them, not only are we gonna get more buy-in, we're also going to be better at at the change that we're trying to make, right? The, the in all stacks, like with just an observation of our own team, we've never had a better outcome than when we literally connected our engineers with our customers yep. and said, "Hey, here's the problem they're trying to solve. Can you help them solve it?" So yeah, actually, we can do that. We understand the orientation of the work that we're trying to do and flow Im improves automatically. I and mean, just think about how many layers in that value stream we cut out by making that connection. <clears throat> Similar to my story of, of the start of my career at IBM, like I would have been so much more fulfilled if I understood how the work that I did connected to the needs of the business, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, how do you, and this goes in all directions, right? How do you get engineering to not be viewed as a black box or a cost center? So we'll relate it to the, to the growth, the, the needs, the struggles, the pains of the business, right? And so when you say, how do we get leadership to buy in? I think it's it's all context, right? Just like we ask leadership for context on the decisions they make, you know, we we need to provide some context on, on the decisions we're making as well. Yeah, super fair um, and great advice. Uh, and then there's a couple that are good. They're kind of linked. So we'll go back to back here. Um, overlaps with Dora a little bit. It says, uh, most of my colleagues are interested in Bob Dora are interested in DORA above all else, excuse me. What's your opinion on prioritizing DORA metrics over, you know, a few key metrics you mentioned earlier? Um, you know, so best practices on that. We know DORA is hot, right? You want me to answer that one? I have, I have, I have opinions on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so if you want to measure DORA metrics, go to the DORA website and take the DORA quick check survey. It takes about 10 minutes and then you're done. You don't have to measure DORA metrics for a long time after that, right? Because all, all that's going to tell you is, um, where are you? 
in your clusters, right? Once you figure out you're in the bottom two clusters, then the real work begins. And that, that involves nothing about Dora metrics. You don't need to measure Dora metrics to do any of that, right? In fact, if you're already measuring Dora metrics, you're pretty good, right? Um, yeah. I, think that, I, think, I think that's the way I look at it. It has got a lot of buzz, but for all intents and purposes, you can measure Dora metrics, you know, by in 15 minutes by just answering those four questions or six questions, just figuring out where you are. And then now you go back to the real metrics that you need to measure to improve your system. Yeah. Awesome. And, you know, the, I think it's cool. Stephen Walters asked a, a question that, that talks a little bit about Dora as well. He said, so how do you see linking efficiency or something like flow metrics? Um, like Dora with effectiveness or realization metrics such as NPS and customer visits. So when you've got that efficiency and effectiveness, how do you see those those playing together? I mean, I think this goes back to what we were seeing or saying earlier, right? So orientation of the pipe is, mm -hmm. is the thing that matters really well, right? So um, <clears throat> with this thing that we're shipping, right? We ship 10... 10 times yesterday. Well, what was the composition of those? What did they impact? Where did they go? Yeah. And so if we shipped features that are intended to improve the experience that a customer has in your product, then ideally the value that's realized is NPS goes up, churn goes down, right? Yeah. And so what's funny is that uh, these metrics can be both leading and lagging indicators. Right. So Dora metrics in the context of engineering itself tend to be lagging indicators, right? If everything else is doing well, then your your ability to deploy to production every day will go up. Your MTTR will go down, right? Like all that stuff will happen. Well, if those things happen, now those are now leading indicators to what the experience the customer has. So if your mean time to recovery goes down, then your customer uh, experiences defects less often, their NPS goes up. Right. And so then that becomes a leading indicator to the lagging indicator of NPS. So it's, it's really all about your context, right? What is your window on the value stream? If you're in that green box that we looked at earlier and you're, it's just very engineering focused, then the, the Dora metrics are way lagging indicators and are just going to be outcomes of optimizing things in flow. If you're, you're customer facing, you're a customer success leader, everything below that is a, before that is a leading indicator. NPS is your lagging indicator. Right. And so even understanding that lens, how are people looking at the value stream? What section are they looking at it? Do they perceive your work as leading or lagging is then going to help you contextualize everything else. Right. And that's that's super important context to apply to the measures as well. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We got about a minute or so left uh, before we before we wrap things up. Uh, looks like we've got a couple more to choose from. Uh, this is good. This kind of speaks a little bit to to the culture piece and the buy in piece that we asked earlier. Jade kind of has a little follow up here. Uh, is it best to start from the top down when trying to improve culture? And how do you navigate that as a leader? So that's that's kind of interesting, given the, the question earlier. You know, we. we we have a kind of interesting perspective on this and that we say start in the middle actually don't start at the top or start at the bottom there's this like there's this you know there, there's like the broad cultural narrative of ineffective middle management right but we actually have a completely different approach to that and that yeah. you know, middle management in a lot of ways is this unsung hero of your organization because they can both make things happen and grind things to a halt they have the the highest intersection of stakeholders and and priorities and objectives across the organization. And they're the ones communicating from the top down and bottoms up. So take that person, <clears throat> that group, and give them the ability to be to be realized, right? And then let that then disperse out into the rest of the organization. So we think start in the middle. And what's cool about starting in the middle is, is the middle gives you a little bit of that governance for the team, but in a very personalized way, like these are goals we'd like to hit, help me hit them, right? Yep. And to the executive leadership, it looks very grassroots. Hey, here's what's bubbling up through my organization that I'm reporting to you that we really need to act on. That then allows you to repeat that cycle. Okay, well, if we need to act on that, we'd like it to be in this frame. So you get a little bit of governance and it's still grassroots, right? And so it's it, to me the middle out perspective is is super powerful and and rarely acknowledged. Yeah. I, I agree with that, and I, I, but I think I also think that the um, you have to have um, 
consistent support for change from the top. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I think that if you don't have that, um, you know, things will the same problem, right? I mean, there's so many ways in which it could go wrong in the middle that um, without without that consistent message that this is the outcome we want to get, uh, it it's, it becomes much harder. Even if the ad is there, there's still pitfalls. But I, it, you actually need really, I think you need change to get change. You need buy-in, pretty much like down the tree somewhere, so you can actually see it. Like you know, if there's an organization tree. You need like a team, a, a middle managers, and a set of executives who are all invested in seeing the change, and then you can actually say, okay, well, here's something that really worked, uh, which you can then at least show across or you know have a way because it can get blocked at almost every every level individually if that's not possible. So that's awesome. Thank you, thank you, and perfect timing as well. I don't know if you planned that or not, but um, we are uh, going to wrap things up. And uh, thank you, thank you, everyone that joined today. Um, we were really thrilled that, that you were able to join us for the two-headed BSM monster uh, culture and metrics. If you have any more questions, want to engage further, um, please do visit the, the the website and the links that are in the chat. Um, they will be in the comments. You know, check out Exa Think. Uh, check out Dr. Krishna and Hirsch on LinkedIn. Uh, we're very, very gracious for your time today, both of you. Um, and we will see everyone that joined us next time. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me, Parker and Hirsch. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Krishna. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone.